appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of their um, Friday to participate in this training. Um, we've been working very hard and trying to come up with this initial grant guidance and uh, process and literally have been building it from the ground up for the last few months. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to let us know. Um, can only make it better. Uh, with that said. Um, what is the subject of this training? Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, IIJA, Section 40601. Orphan well plugging remediation um, program basically has three type of grants we're working on. We have the initial state grants. 775 million. Which we're going to talk about today. But there'll also be opportunities in the future for formula grants. 2 billion. And performance grants. 1.5 billion. I'm going to be talking about the process in general. And then um, Matt, who's here with me. Um, from Interior Business Center, we'll talk more about the forms. This training addresses the initial state grant application process. There we go. So for initial state grants, there are basically two options. There's a large scale initial grant, uh, which is you can apply for up to 25 million. Um, you do have 90 days to obligate 90% of the towards projects through contracts, um, staff, those kind of things. There is a 10% cap on administrative costs that is called out in, in the bill itself. And then, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, applications must be in no later than midnight on Friday 13th, uh, 2022. The small scale grants um, are eligible for funding up to 5 million. Um, there isn't any cap on administrative costs because I think the intent is more for capacity building. If you are going to apply it for um, doing well plugging, though, you will need to probably provide a few more forms. Um, and there isn't a deadline, as I mentioned, but uh, you have to be able to execute all the funding um, by September 30th, 2030. So you need to keep that in mind if uh, you're going to be doing contracting and it takes a while to expend funds and draw, uh, draw down that money. Uh, the money does go away uh, on September 30th in, in 2030. I'd like to point out that you may only apply for one or the other of these initial grants and you can only apply once. Um, as a reminder though, um, there are additional grant opportunities going to be made available soon through the formula and performance grants. Large scale grant application. To be complete, the application should include sufficient details to provide assurances regarding the ability of the state to properly carry out and oversee the activities to be funded. So with the grant program, we have to make sure that the money that is going out is being used for the intended purpose and that you have the capabilities of executing those uh, funds. So we're gonna be in the grant application, we're asking for a lot of details, and that's because we have to measure whether you're able to carry it out and whether the funds are going to be used for the intended purpose. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of those details. Um, but if you have any questions about those, feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to walk you through those. So with large scale grant application, um, there are a number of forms that are required and Matt will be going into those in a minute. But you need to do an SF-424 uh, V4 application for federal assistance. You have to do the um, 424 for budget information for non-construction projects. There's an SFLLL disclosure of lobbying activities. So we wanna make sure that the, form, or the funds that you're getting are not gonna be used for lobbying. Um, there's a OMB form 4040-0010. Key contact form. This form's important because we need to know who to contact at your state if we have any questions about um, the grant program. So make sure you have the right contacts down there with good contact uh, information. We need to have a detailed budget proposal and justification explaining how you're going to be expending these funds. So we kind of need a breakdown of unit costs over the period for this initial grant. Um, this would include a breakdown on um, what costs are going to be used for personnel, salaries, benefits, um, projections for travel, uh, what materials and supplies you might be purchasing, equipment, 
and certainly um, what the breakdown would be for any consultants and contracts. And then we also need a uh, project abstract summary. OMB form member 4040-0019. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt to talk a little bit more about these forms. So like we talked about, there's, there's the standard forms that we have. SF forms. SF-424, Application for Federal Assistance. SF-424A, Budget for Non-Construction. SF-LLL, Disclosure of Lobbying Activities. Um, like I said, we already talked about the first three, the last one. SF-424B. The Assurances for Non-Construction. Since most of you will be applying as states, you should have an up-to-date SAM.gov registration, so you've already covered those assurances, but if you have any questions about that or you are missing those assurances, we can we can wrap that up with an SF-424B if needed. Um, I also gave you a link to the form repository on there. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.grants.gov forward slash web forward slash grants forward slash forms forward slash SF-424 dash family dot HTML. So that's like I said, that link there will get you all the forms that you need. You can follow that to grants.gov. And like I said, they're all in the repository there. And there's also instruction documents. So when you get to the form repository, you'll see like the PDF to download. And then right next to that, it'll say instructions. So it provides a general guidance to fill out the forms. And then like the last part, like you, since well, you know, we're, we're going to be doing non-construction, but if you do as you put together your proposal and you're doing different things, if you do think you'll be going into that, you know, you might think that this is construction or you have any questions about construction, non-construction, like I said, feel free to contact program staff to kind of discuss that and we can work with you too if something comes up. Um, but with all that, let's uh, go ahead and look at the forms. So let's start with the first one, the SF-424. I said you'll be able to pull this down and have a fillable form if you pull from grants.gov. Um, the nice thing about this is it does give you those nice little boxes that show you what's required. Highlighted required fields include date received, legal name, employer forward slash taxpayer identification number, EIN forward slash TIN, and UEI. Like I said, most of this information, like I said, you'll be pulling... You know, you'll be pulling and submitting this information. The um, the UEI will come from grants.gov, but since you'll be, you know, you, as you guys as states, you'll there'll be somebody ensure that you're checking with your uh, state to see who, you know, for assistance with filling out these forms if there's various things you want you to do. Because like I said, you know, states, they're very well versed in this. So there should be somebody available in your organization that can help you. Uh, complete your SF-424 forms. And again, as you go through it, there's, you know, different things to, different things uh, that are required to fill out. Additional highlighted required fields include address, street one, city, state, zip, name and contact information of person to be contacted on matters involving this application, first name, last name, telephone number, and email. And then we, you know, like I said, these, these forms are required for all financial assistance because it gives us information. It's a nice place to find information and flow it up. Like we talked about, there's some contact information on there, different things. Um, like I said, you'll be filling this out. Um, there's a slide later that kind of will provide you the information here. The only thing that we'll, we provide for you, since this is a little bit of a different way of doing a, submission since a lot of times this would be auto populated if you go through grants.gov but since we're doing it by an email address um, we did and block 10 I, I gave the name of the federal agency block 11 the catalog for federal domestic assistance numbers in there and then the title of that and then for our own internal system we have a funding opportunity number and a title so I, I provided, they'll be on the slide, one of the uh, upcoming slides. But like I said, if you don't fill that out, we can work with you. Like I said, not, not the biggest thing. And like I said, as we go through it, each, each section, you know, different things and fill it out to the best of your ability. Um, again, there's an, the yellow boxes are the ones that are really required. Additional highlighted required field includes descriptive title of applicant's project. 
Congressional Districts of Applicant, and B Program Forward Slash Project. Proposed Project A Start Date, and B End Date. Estimate Funding Dollars, A Federal, B Applicant, C State, D Local, E Other, and F Program Income. There's the project title. Then, like I said, we'll, you know, a lot of this information is just a, the, the form gives us a nice place to find critical information for various things in our systems and when we have to report it up to Congress and other and OMB. There's a um, the budget, uh, funding information, different things like that. Additional highlighted required question 19. Is application subject to review by state under Executive Order 12372 process? Next question, 20. Is the applicant delinquent on any federal debt? If yes, provide explanation and attachment. Next highlighted required item is a checkbox next to I agree. I said again, contact your state to see if you fall under Executive Order. One two three seven two process. Usually, there's a state office. Usually, the secretary of state has a uh, um, someone that does it does it for you. Then, like I said, kind of go through this, and then you gotta make sure you have an authorized rep for your state signs this document, fills out their information. Highlighted required field for authorized representative includes first name, last name, title, telephone number email, signature, and date signed. But like I said, that's not, it's not too bad. And then like I said, there's some, there'll be an instruction document on a grant slide go if you need it. And feel free to contact me if you have any questions about filling out the forms. The next one is the budget form. So this is kind of a, a simplified budget um, for your project. Since we're doing non-construction, it is a little bit different than you would see in a construction budget. So here, like I said, if you have overlapping federal funding or other grant programs for some reason, which most likely you won't, but like I said, if you do, this is the place you would put it so that we can kind of see where all the funding is coming from for the project. Form titled Budget Information Non-Construction Programs, OMB number 4040-0006. Section A, Budget Summary. Large table with four rows highlighted input fields across seven columns. The columns titles include A grant program function or activity, B catalog of federal domestic assistance number. Estimated unobligated funds includes two columns, C federal and D non-federal. Next is new or revised budget that includes three columns, E federal, F non-federal, and G total. The fifth row has totals for the last five columns. The next one is the one that you'll probably be filling out. The, and like I said, here it lists the costs. So as you can see, there's personnel, fringe benefits, supplies, equipment, contractual, all those things. So yeah, feel free to fill these out based on your budget that you get. Section B, budget categories with a table. The first column in the table is titled object class categories. Next is four numbered columns under title grant program, function, or activity. The last column is total. The row titles are six, object class categories. Then, A personnel, B fringe benefits, C travel, D equipment, E supplies, F contractual, G construction, H other, I total direct charge, the sum of 6A6H, J indirect charges, and K totals, the sum of 6I and 6J. The final row in the table is program income, which also expands across all columns. Um, and as like I said, you probably won't have to have any program income with this project. Then again, we move into the next page and it kind of goes over the same thing. We won't, we won't be had, we, well, it's not required, but if you have any non-federal resources or any information that you want to add, you know, just, 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 just informative. If you have anything else you want to put in there, you can put in there. Then you move on to the next section, kind of covers forecasted cash needs, which is fine with this with this program. It's not the biggest thing. So like I said, the best you can forecast. Section C, non-federal resources has four rows with input fields under the column titles a grant program, B applicant, C state, D other sources, and E totals. 
The next row has total the sum of line 8 through 11. Section D forecasted cash needs with three row titles, federal, non-federal, and total the sum for lines 13 and 14. The columns include total for first year, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter. In the next section, you know, that again, it covers, kind of covers the budget estimates of federal funds needed for the project since, you know, and again, just kind of do your best of your ability, fill these out, provide, info, you know, provide the relevant budget information so that we can give it a look and see where we're at. Section E, budget estimates of federal funds needed for balance of the project. Table has four rows with input fields under the column titles, a grant program. The title, Future Funding Periods and Years, is above four columns titled B first, C second, D third, and E fourth. The next row has total the sum of line 16 through 19. Sections F, Other Budget Information with Highlighted Required Fields for Direct Charges, Indirect Charges, and Remarks. The next form is that SFLLL, like um, we discussed earlier. Again, federal financial assistance requirements. Very, there's, there's a few requirements that require you to disclose lobbying activities. Can I, if, if you're applying as a state, you might check with your, your um, leadership to see. Usually there's someone that provides the information that you need to fill out your lobbying activities, or some, a lot of times we'll see a state send a certified letter on letterhead that, you know, kind of explains why they don't have lobbying activity. So, but again, it's pretty, it's just a standard form. And if you do have a lobbyist and you get their information, uh, feel, you know, fill out, the, fill out the form as best you can. The following required fields, name and address of reporting entity, federal department or agency, name and address of lobbying registrant, individual performing services name, signature, name, and date. Covering all that information. And then again, you'll need a you'll need a signature from someone who's authorized to sign for your, your disclosure. And then like I said, so and that again, that's available on grants.gov if you need it. And there should be some instructions there. But again, like I said, I would I would contact your your uh, entity's leadership and check on the lobbying activities that may be performed. And then, like I said, the, so those are the required standard forms. I want to go over the OMB forms that we're using. So these forms, like again, we talked about key contacts earlier. You want to fill this out with, like I said, feel free to add as many contacts as you want. But we on the, on, on the slide, we do kind of cover what we're kind of looking for. You know, we're looking for like a project manager of the project usually a business or administrative contact for like the financial side of the house. And then usually you'll throw an authorized rep or like a manager on there to contact, but feel free to add as many people as you feel would need. All that we ask is that you kind of fill out this uh, contact project role and kind of explain what they're doing. Form has the following required fields, application organization name, contact one project role, name, address, telephone number and email and that'll give it as you add like i said when you go down to the bottom these nice fillables you just keep adding the next person it'll give us a nice list of contacts for this project and the next one so this is a omb requirement now we need a project abstract summary from you on this project and we, the, the slide provides some guidance and that initial guidance document that was sent out earlier provides some guidance on this. But again, um, we're looking for us, you know, we'll fill it out, cover your, cover the, the that information you can pull from your SF424 and then provide that title. But the thing, once you get to the project abstract, we're looking for award purpose, activities to be performed and expected deliverable or outcomes of the project, intended beneficiaries, and if you have any subrecipients, the activities that they'll be performing. Um, the, the, you know, again, it, this, this nice form gives you a character limit, so that works great because that's the character limit in our system when we input it. Again, we ask that you don't use identifiable sensitive information because this is, this abstract usually flows up 
to some of the transparency requirements that we have. So you'll see it you'll see the project abstract maybe posted on the successful projects if they post those in a press release and then in the USA spending website you'll see a project abstract for this funding so with that we ask that you kind of write this for general public you know maybe a reviewer that doesn't have specific knowledge of the program or this type of project you know you won't be having you know that the, they won't have the technical expertise to break a lot of this stuff down so they, you know, the OMB asked that it's written in plain language, avoiding agency specific terminology and acronyms and excessive technical jargon. Form has the following required fields, funding opportunity number, applicant's name, descriptive title of applicant's project and project abstract. And the next one, like I said, we'll go through the slides. When we go back to the slides, we'll talk about the detailed budget proposal and justification. Form with title budget narrative files with one required field, mandatory budget narrative file name. But that is the required forms that we have for this application package. So we can return to the slideshow. Again, here's those blocks that I said I, I would provide the information for for them for the SF424. So yeah, if, when you're filling it out, you can reference back to this slideshow. And if, if, you, if you end up losing it or need any assistance, feel free to contact us and we'll get it out to you. Block 10, name of federal agency, Office of Environmental Policy and Compliance, Department of Interior. Block 11, Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, number 15.018. CFDA title, Energy Community Revitalization Program, ECRP and Block 12, Funding Opportunity, D-AQD-FA-22-003, Title Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Section 40,601 Orphaned Well Program. Uh, we talked about the OMB forms. Again, like key contacts include, you know, we had the three main ones we want you to include, but yeah, feel free to include anybody that you want available for us to contact. OMB Form 4040-0010 Key Contacts Form and OMB Form 4040-0019 Project Abstract Summary. Form Repository HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.grants.gov forward slash web forward slash grants forward slash forms forward slash sf-424 dash family dot html. The key contacts may include the project manager of the project, the business or administrative point of contact for the project, and the authorized representative of your organization. Here's that. We talked about the project abstract summary. Here's the things that you want to remember when you're writing that abstract summary. OMB requirement for financial assistance agreements includes award purpose consistent with assistance listing. SAM.gov listing, activities to be performed, expected deliverables or outcomes, intended beneficiaries, and subrecipient activities. Using 4,000 characters or less, do not use identifiable, sensitive, or proprietary information. The abstract should be written for the general public and reviewers who do not have specific knowledge of the program or technical expertise. Award descriptions shall be written in plan language avoiding agency-specific terminology and acronyms and technical jargon. Then the budget estimate. So for I, we, we saw that one where you can attach. There's a nice, there's a nice uh, form where you can attach. And if you don't use that form, you can still just submit it with the application package. But basically, it's just kind of a breakdown. I mean, when you develop your budget estimate, you probably are doing all this work anyway. So just attach any any itemized thing, because like I said, that that budget form that you filled earlier is pretty much a lump sum. So it helps us helps us with our uh, evaluation of the budget estimate, the budget, like it helps us determine if it's you know the work, the budget, and cost categories are allowable, allocable, and reasonable for the project. So that'll be a big help. And another thing that helps with that is a budget narrative. So, I mean, you kind of, we want to write a budget narrative that kind of ties your budget into your project. So it kind of explains what, what each one of the, you know, what the, the budget 
categories what what's inside those is doing for the project so we can kind of connect the proposed activities to the budget and kind of review that to make sure that everything you know matches up and your budget covers your project and your project covers your budget that that's helpful and then for budget justification like i said you're already working up these things you're developing estimates you're developing different things so yeah feel free to provide those because if you know as we're evaluating your budget we might have clarifications in the future so if you do have that stuff feel free to send it with your application package like i said it's it could come down like you know links estimating methodology quotes anything you use to build your budget and a lot of times you guys you guys are using those anyway you know you already you already have them so if you send them with this we won't have to request them if we need them to determine reasonableness of the cost And the last one I want to talk about is the administrative cost. Definition. Administrative costs identified in Section 40601C2BI, limited to not more than 10% of the funds received. Two are those costs that cannot be directly attributed to activities listed under Section 40601C2A, I through Roman numeral 8, but instead to general grants management or program administration. Administrative costs can be expended for personal or non-personnel costs and can be direct or indirect, but should represent the costs to the state for managing the overall grant-funded work rather than preparation for and execution of individual projects. So it, it, for this one, we talked about that a little bit earlier and what the requirements are for the large scale. And like I said, what, from the statute, you know, 90% of the requested funding is to be used to issue new contracts added to existing contracts or issue grants for plugging and remediation and reclamation work. So for the admin administrative costs, that's that other 10% that'll be in your budget. So feel free kind of to point those out, but like I said, it'll most likely be things that aren't new contracts or grants being issued by your your state for plugging orphan wells. But again, like I said, the administrative costs, like I said, you could be personal, non-personal cost, indirect or direct. So, I mean, each state probably has a different way of developing their uh, budget estimates and their budgets for these projects. So yeah, just kind of point that stuff out. And like I said, it seems, you know, the good, that last sentence there's a really good thing to remember. They seems to be pointing this administrative cost to overall grant funded work rather than the preparation execution of the individual projects. So you'd be looking at kind of the admin costs or all the various agencies and offices that'll probably be assisting you with this. And with this, like I said, feel free, feel free to reach out if you, as you develop your budget and you have questions about the admin cost and kind of, I can kind of help guide you or see, you know, kind of, you know, help you with your proposed budget and see where we're at. And then, like I said at the bottom, it refer we, we talked about permissible uses of the grant funds and the guidance. So yeah, refer back to that guidance also when you're developing your budget and working on admin cost. And that is my last slide. So like I said, I'll be around for when you have your, after, during the Q&A after this. And like I said, anytime, shoot an email if you need any assistance with these forms or want to discuss some budget stuff, feel free to contact me. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna next kind of switch and talk over to um, what's gonna happen with your application after you've sent it in and then um, how we process it. And then we'll talk a little bit about award and effective date. Uh, I think you got it now. Got it now? Okay. I Sorry. Think you, I think you have it now. I, I see it moving. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Sure. So um, once you fill out those forms and you have your package signed and it's ready to be submitted, you just submit it to our uh, email box at orphanwells at ios.doigov. Um, I have staff that will be going into the mailbox on a regular basis and 
once they pull your uh, application, they will send you an acknowledgement email back to let you know that we now have it and we're starting to process it. I do not intend to use an automated response email. So when you get your acknowledgement email, you know we have hands on to your application. Um, that's when my office is going to start looking at all the packages, making sure that the information um, is accurate and complete, um, that the application is eligible for, for grant funding. Um, and then if we're finding any um, questions or deficiencies, we'll reach out to the state to try to get those resolved as soon as possible. We'll also be sharing the package with um, Interior Business Center um, so they can start doing their piece on uh, financial review on the applications. And hopefully this will cut down the time on processing these uh, grant applications. Um, once we've identified that the application is complete, um, we will develop a funding recommendation memo and we will be sending that to um, Interior Business Center. That kind of starts 30 day clock for uh, us to get funds distributed to states. So we've kind of talked about two different dates here. One is an award date, one's an effective date. Um, the award date is a date that we cut the award contract or grant award with the state. However, funds aren't quite available yet for drawdown. Um, What's going to happen is our agreements offer, officer is going to reach out to the state and negotiate um, what we call our period of performance. And that's basically the um, effective date of when you first start doing pull down of funds. This is to give states a little extra time because um, you, as you're aware, you have that 90 day clock to obligate 90% of your uh, grant funds. So if say there's a state who needs a little more time from the date of award to up to 90 days to get contracts or uh, staff in place, you can negotiate that effective date with the uh, agreements officer. Now for those states that have had everything all lined up, they're ready to go, they've got their list, they've got their contracts, and once they sign the award date, if they want that to be their effective date, that again is negotiated with the agreements officer and then you could start pulling funds immediately. But we kind of built this in hopefully to give a little more flexibility to the states because everyone was seemed to be in a kind of different position. So um, we hope this is gonna be helpful. Um, you'll have to do your drawdowns through um, the application called ASAP. Um, most of your grant offices are aware of this application, already have accounts, but if you need to set up one, let us know. We can forward you the registration documentation to do that. Once you start pulling funds, you're on the clock for doing quarterly financial and uh, performance reports. Um, those are usually due 30 days after the end of a um, federal fiscal quarter. So, um, they have some dates on the slide here of, of when those will be due. Federal fiscal quarter dates include July 31, October 31, January 31, April 30, etc. Now, small scale grants, which are those $5 million grants, um, you still have required forms you have to fill out. And these are pretty much the same as the large scale grants. But if you're not doing any plugging, you're just doing um, capacity building. These are all the forms you need. If you're going to be doing um, well plugging, we're going to ask that you provide some additional information. Required elements for small scale grant certification. Attachment A number one, SF-424 V4 application for federal assistance. Two, SF-424, a budget information for non-construction programs. Three, SF-LLL disclosure of lobbying activities. Four, OMB Form 4040-0010 key contacts form. Five, detailed budget proposal justification that supports the costs in the SF-424A. 
should include an itemized budget breakdown with unit costs for the period of the initial grant funding, costs of personnel salaries, fringe benefits, project staff travel, materials and supplies, equipment and consultant and contracts. 6. Project Abstract Summary, OMB Form Number 4040-0019. And this goes for both um, the large scale and the small scale, and I'll talk about those in a moment. I wanted to touch base again on reporting a little bit. Um, we are looking for quarterly reports so we can kind of monitor how you're pro progressing, both financially and with uh, the well plugging. So we're, we're going to be looking for these um, quarterly reports. These can be due at the end of the fiscal quarter. Um, we're also looking for um, report on personal property. SF-428. That you purchase. So any uh, equipment that you're purchasing for your program, we need you to keep track of, and then that'll go on to this uh, personal property report. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's done at the end of the grant period. Um, final reports. So as we're wrapping up, um, towards the end of the year, and you're wrapping up all your uh, your, your grant, uh, we're going to need a final financial report on how you expended the funds. SF-425. Performance report, and all those are due at 120 days after the um, period of performance end date. And that would basically be 12 months after the effective date. And then the law requires a 15-month report. If these two dates kind of coincide, I think you can submit the 15 month report and um, that would replace the quarterly report for that period. So for both the large scale and small scale grants, we're asking for some additional information, the recommended elements, just so we can have a better understanding of your program and how you're managing it. Um, and we're also asking for these in the performance report. So we're looking for how you determine orphan wells, what your plugging standards are, prioritization and ranking process, how um, will communities that are impacted be identified and addressed? Are you measuring uh, methane and other gases and how are you tracking those? Are you have measurements and tracking for groundwater and surface water contamination? Um, how much infrastructure removal, soil remediation, habitat restoration, um, which methodologies are, and then how are you working with local communities? We're also looking at what's your process for identifying undocumented wells? Are you setting up any local training, working with apprenticeships? How are you hiring opportunities for underrepresented and underserved communities? We're also looking at how you might be doing federal and tribal coordination. I, we believe there's a great opportunity for reducing some costs if we can, um, for example, with some of the federal agencies um, that might be near state wells or vice versa, where you're going out to work on um, state grant wells, and maybe there's a few federal wells nearby that are orphaned. Maybe there's an opportunity to just have one MOVE and have that contractor do um, all the wells in that one site. And then we also would like to see cooperation um, and coordination with the tribes. Um, we want to make sure that you have proper access process for private property. Um, get an idea of what your work schedule and work plan is for um, how you're doing your plugging. And then if you have an indirect cost rate agreement, if it's applicable, we'd like to um, look at that. Um, again, if you have questions or email or um, need more information, you reach out through our email address, orphanwells at ios.dy.gov. We've also established a website where we've posted the initial grant guidance and we'll be posting additional uh, resources in the future. www.doi.gov forward slash oak forward slash legacy dash pollution dash remediation dash and dash reclamation. Um, for instance, we recently um, posted the protocols for doing methane measurements um, 
And then I think we've also put up a Excel spreadsheet to help kind of track some of those, these data requirements. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk about SAM.gov? Yep. Like I said, the bottom part bullet there says SAM.gov is used to register to do business with federal government. The states you guys all have SAM.gov registrations. So I would find the person in your state that does it for you. The important for you filling out these applications, it's where you get your unique, unique entity identifier number. That's very important for federal financial assistance. That's how we track you as an entity and it goes on a lot of documents. Like I said, just verify your registration is active and like I said, check with your organization. Um, and then another one, you know, make sure your point of contacts are current or update if needed. But like I said, it's within your organization. There's someone that runs your SAM.gov. They're usually your SAM.gov point of contact. So feel free to, like I said, check with them. And then I let I gave you a couple night a uh, couple links at the bottom, one to sam.gov and one to the help desk. If anybody ends up needing to register for sam.gov, let a, let us know, and then we we can assist with that and track that because it does take a little bit of time. But like I said, generally everybody should be good to go on sam.gov, and then uh, asap.gov again. Like we said, it's that system that will you'll be able to request payments just where you can see your balances and that's important for you when you do your financial reporting again as a state you probably have a asap point of contact or someone that runs that for you um, so you probably have an active asap registration so again verify points of contact and account information and then check with them make sure they're able to log in again like i said you guys very likely have someone that does this all for you. It's just somewhere within your state. I did put a, the help this number there if you end up having login information or, in, or you know login problems or anything like that. ASAP help desk number one, 855-868-0151. Option two, option three. And like I said, the only thing, like I said, we'll, I, I, I can get into it. When you guys start submitting your applications, I will check ASAP gov to make sure that you guys are linked to our agency identifier number and if not there's just an enrollment form that you'll need to fill out and we'll all send them, I will send that out to you if needed and again you'll probably end up sending it to somebody within your state to help or finalize filling it out but if you end up needing to register for ASAP for any reason I'll assist you with that if we don't it's not just linking the account but starting a new one that takes a little bit of time, but I will assist you with getting that done and getting you in contact with our ASAP group here at the Interior Business Center. And then we did talk about Grant Solutions a little bit, but we, like I said, Grant Solutions is the system that the Department of Interior uses. And at this time, um, the Interior Business Center Acquisitions Directorate. We use it to execute agreements and documents and get, you know, close out basically all the all the execution actions are done through there. Like I said, so we don't do reports and we don't do lot of amendment requests and various things through there. All that will be done through email and all that stuff will be covered in your uh, agreement document when you get your award. Um, I did throw a link in there if you want to learn more about Grant Solutions, but again, the, this program will not be using Grant Solutions for anything beyond just executing the agreement. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.doi.gov forward slash grants forward slash Grant Solutions. All right. Well, that wraps up our training, and I believe we're going to open it up to questions. So, um, photo of an orphaned well site. Yeah, and um, Bill, I just want to jump in just a second.